This episode is sponsored by Bandai Namco. I'm Kerry Stagmer, and we are the blacksmiths of Baltimore Knife and Sword. We're going to be building some of your favorite things and fantastic objects you've never seen before. This is Man at Arms, Reforged. Today on Man at Arms, we're going to be building an amazing axe from Elden Ring the axe of Godric, the grafted king. This has massive forgings for the edges, and then the large sections of the axe are engraved on all four sides, you know, both faces and both of the back panels. Actually, it's even engraved on the top, and it's a huge amount. We're gonna use the CNC machines to cut this engraving, but we'll go back and do a lot of hand finishing so it has that traditional look. We'll get the whole thing together, and then we'll really be able to smash some stuff. Starting with a bar of 4150 alloy steel, Derek goes to the forge, brings it up to temperature, and then off to the nasal to begin creating this form. top tool on the power hammer, Derek now forms this much closer to the template. It's going to take a lot of work, but this is the kind of thing that experience under the hammer makes such a huge difference on. So while Derek is doing hot stuff in the forge, I'm gonna be doing cold stuff in the machine shop. So we're not gonna be making donuts this time. Instead, we'll be making the side plates for the ax. We're gonna be using the Novacon CNC mill to cut a depth of about a 32nd of an inch into this steel. Now each plate takes about two and a half hours and there are four of them. I know we hear a lot of comments on YouTube where people say that using the CNC machine is cheating or somehow working very quickly. Well, on plates of this size, this amount of engraving would have taken us weeks to cut. You saw where Tanner was running the CNC mill and basically going through and engraving the entire surface. But we need to differentiate the background from the foreground. The background on this is going to be darkened and the foreground is going to be gold. So the way that we're going to do that is I've created some texturing chasing tools. These specifically have textures on the ends. They're extremely hard so they can be hammered right into the steel and that's what's going to show us our background which will be darkened and then we'll paint the gold surface for the foreground.
creating two lines that go on the face of the axe in the center. I'm going to do them in Chasing and Repose in Copper. They are fairly low relief. So when I start dishing them out, I don't have to get as much depth, probably half an inch to an inch. I can do that in my sandbag, but I wanna make sure that my emblem is facing the correct direction since I will be dishing it on the back and then flipping it over. And after I flip it over, I'm going to fill the back with pitch and work in with my Chasing Repose tool to get all the detail in the mane and uh, the tail and everywhere else. See Ellen go back and forth bringing the torch in and heating up the material. When you have a piece of copper, it is very soft, but as soon as you begin hammering it, it will work harden. She takes the torch to it, brings it up to temperature, and then quenches in water. That will make it so soft you can almost move it with your hands, but it'll harden very quickly as she gets back to work. As she creates more detail while working, it'll be much easier to see where the beginning and ending of this work is so that she knows where she's working from. Whenever she takes a torch to it, it's gonna lose all the drawing work, so she'll just go back over with a pen and sketch it. It's pretty amazing how she keeps the form in her head and can put it right back on the metal and bring it to shape. As always on these bigger forgings, it takes teamwork. Typically, somebody is working the material or working under the hammer. Sometimes there's someone else holding the material the entire time. Everyone has to be skilled or the wrong blows will happen. The form will be wrong. Nothing like that here. Derek, Kevin, and Decker, very skilled. They just keep moving forward. Kevin and I got these rocked out. Forgings are all done. These were a fun forging to do, uh, getting the width that you need here, but also the curvature. It's not a terribly challenging shape. However, getting this the right width and getting these shoulders pushed in was a little challenge, but kind of fun. We've got uh, two of these that match at this point. Uh, this is gonna go on to Bill now, and he's gonna do the grinding on it. To admit to underestimating just how tedious all of this texture work is, Paul steps in because we have four plates to do. It's an incredible amount of work, and he just keeps going at it and keeps going at it. We'll be at it for days. Even though we've shown you the side plates and the forgings, there's a whole lot more to this axe. The center body is actually fairly large, and we're cutting it out of 10 gauge plate with a, it's about an eighth of an inch thick material. John's gonna cut these pieces out. That's gonna form the center main section of the body for the ax that supports everything, 
and the handle, which is a steel pipe, is actually gonna go all the way through to the very top so that when things are smashing, everything is supported. This is precision work and John is very good at it. If you don't have everything just right, you just create more work for yourself later. He's always prepared things and made them fit perfectly. In case you were wondering, yeah, that's probably about a cubic foot of material if it was solid. That means it would be more than 400 pounds. That's why we work the way we do. John just needed a couple of sections to do the curved part on the top of this. He figured it out. They're the same as a pipe that we had sitting in stock. He's just gonna go to the mill and cut out a few sections, put them in place and weld them. you watched me machine the parts for these little scoop sections and then welded them in place. Now that we have them all blended, I started working on the top box. The sides are now tack welded onto our base plate and I'd like to check and see how it fits. Looks pretty good, fits nicely. Next, we need to finish welding our sides on and then fabricate the remaining pieces, get them all welded and blended and then we can put the top on. So I have most of the form raised up and I have it basically sketched out with my Chasing Repose tools. Right now I'm going in and refining a lot of these lines and cleaning them up. Don't be deceived just because this hammer's little. After using it for about 30 hours or so, your neck and your shoulder aren't so happy with you. Uh, if you're doing this type of work, I would spread it out over the course of a couple weeks so you don't just keep making those little muscles super angry. And it just keeps going and going. Paul's being a really good sport doing this. I know from lots of experience that it begins to cramp your hands. So we're trying to spread it out over the two weeks that we're doing this work. I take the hand plasma and cut off the excess. Since we're gonna be sanding these very closely before we begin assembly, it's important to have most of the material out of your way. Otherwise, we'd just be adding work. 
once we get all of this cut and clean, we'll be able to see more of the final form for this axe. Much like the sides of the axe, the shields have a fair amount of form cut in them. I'm working with a slightly thinner material, so I have to be careful as Tanner engraves them. We'll get the depth cut, then I'll be able to trim them, we'll get them to Derek, and they'll get their form. Typically, you see us sanding, we're using the biggest wheel that will fit the part that we need so that we have the largest contact area that creates the smoothest finish. Sometimes we've got small parts. When we've got to get into a little curve like this, we use a slack belt and just be very careful. We don't want to overgrind because it'll show in the final pattern. Carrie and Tanner got this thing machined for us. Uh, this is the shield that's going to go on the side of the axe. So what I'm gonna be doing is taking this over a stake with a small hammer and creating height by folding this down as a, like a bezel around the perimeter of this. It's gonna make it look a lot better. and Paul make this, well, they make it look pretty easy. It is not. When they get into those small sections with a real small radius on the edge of that shield, th that is very difficult to get the look right. These guys, they just knock it out. We've got these forgings fastened down to the table. We're just gonna go at them with a cutter and cut the shape. It's gonna take a little while. We're gonna do 10 passes to create it but rather than take the time to try and drill and grind this, we'll let the CNC machine do the shape so that we can do the other side and it'll be exactly the same. While we could heat treat these basically as they are, it makes a whole lot more sense to grind the material much closer to the form that we need. We gotta get those edges down beyond, you know, we forge them some, but they've, they've gotta come way down, especially where we cut them. Bill's gonna get into that. That way, when we go to heat treating, we're much closer to form and we don't have to induce a lot of heat while we're polishing and sharpening. Kevin's gonna get these into the preheated forge. We'll get them up to at least 1500 degrees, and then they'll be quenched, they'll be hard. We do put them through a tempering process at 400 degrees for two hours in one of our electric furnaces. Now that these are hard, it's 
gonna take him a while. He's gotta reduce some of the edge sizes, and now is when he'll make them fit. He'll make sure everything fits exactly after this heat treating, because they can move a little bit during that quench. Then he'll get them polished, and then sharp. These things are big. So I'm done the chasing repoussé work on these lions. The next thing I'm gonna do is use my jewelry saw with my tiny little blade to cut around the frame. It's probably gonna take more than one saw blade because I'm gonna break a couple depending on the day. We'll see how that goes. Not a big deal, but once this is all cut out, it's going to be mounted on the ax face. eight large gemstones on the top of this axe. It's just not something that's feasible for us to create as a gemstone, it would be too expensive. So we're gonna use some specialty glass. Lauren's gonna sit down and do some lamp work creating these beads. Thankfully, we do have a die in carbon that is exactly the size we need. So she'll bring up the temperature, press them into the die that creates that dome or that cabochon but before the end, she's gotta cut them off and we'll put them in a furnace so that they cool down slowly, otherwise they'll break. Tanner's now creating the bezels that will hold the glass cabochons. He takes a bar of steel, bores the center the size that we need, and then just freehand shapes all of these. He's gotten very good at this. We actually have several lathes, and he has one at home that he practices on. That's a very high quality machine. So he's pretty handy. I don't really have to pay attention to what he's doing. I just make him a rough sketch, and he makes it happen. John switches over to the TIG welder, which allows him much more control. That way he can take these steel bezels, set them in the locations that I showed him, and then we can put the glass cabochons in last. For the leaves on the bottom of the handle, I sketched out a quick line drawing, and that's what's gonna create the die. So we're gonna take a piece of steel, go up on this milling machine, and just kind of cut some depth on it. That way, when we go to the press, give it some lead backing, it'll force the brass down inside of that cavity. We'll be able to use this die over and over again. Should work great. finished up lathe cutting the pommel section, then it's been polished on the sanders, but there's fluting on it. So we left the very cap section off to add on to it later, but Derek's gonna go in on this knife wheel and cut in the fluted section so that it has much more of the look of the actual ax. I have the pieces for the ax here. I have the shield covers and I have both ax blades. Uh, we had the option of either heat blowing this or chemical blowing. Um, I'm gonna go with chemical blowing. It's a faster process, gets it done, it has a good color to it. I've already degreased these. Then I'm gonna go through with a scotch Brite pad into the chemical, then I'll start scrubbing in here and you should see a change right off the bat.
with all the individual sections created, we can now begin putting this thing together. There's a lot to it. You have to think about order of operation. You have to think about what you can and can't get to, what you can and can't pick up as it gets heavier and heavier, and what gets covered by what. You know, the shield is gonna cover over a certain area, but then the lions will go on top of that. So we really have to think through and do things in the proper order, then this piece will be completed. After weeks of work from the entire team, behold the axe of Godric, the grafted king. Click here to subscribe or click here to see more episodes. Thanks for watching Man at Arms Reforged. We need to know what you want the team to build. Tell us in the comments below what you would like to see.